Welcome to your third of what will be four vodcasted lectures this semester. And if you're watching this in the regular classroom, of course it is Friday. And you're probably beginning to think about some upcoming events. For example, perhaps your group has been mulling over those suggestions that I gave you for your hypothesis, and maybe thinking about making some updates to your hypothesis, maybe even to the point where you're finalizing um, and having a very fluid statement that you're sending off to me for the last time. Wherever you are, I'm going to suggest that you get your next draft of your revised hypothesis to me by Sunday or Monday. That will give me a chance to give you the last little bit of feedback and be certain that we're all on the same page and have a really great direction for the remainder of the project, which by the way is the easy part of the project uh, because once you have your hypothesis, the rest is all just details and putting together the poster in the end is the fun part. So this really is the hard part that you've been working on now. You're going to notice that I did make a change with regard to homework five. Rather than it being due on Tuesday, I have moved the date to Wednesday. And the reason that I did that is because your practical exam is on Tuesday. And I want you to be able to think about studying for that practical and not having to worry about anything besides studying for that practical. We don't have a pre-lab on that day, so your sole responsibility on Tuesday will be just thinking about the practical exam. So homework five will be due the next day on the 17th, so you can perhaps if you would like submit that uh, on Wednesday instead of on Tuesday. If you're needing help at all on that homework, of course I always have all my regular office hours, but if you would like to attend the SI session, remember that that is going on today from 3 to 4 p.m. after our regular lecture time. For so, so for some of you that'll just mean staying here uh, after the, the, le the lecture is done. So I mentioned lab and the practical exam. Once again, just a, a very brief reminder that you should try to use the study aids that I've provided for that. For example, there is a review that's posted on the additional information website for the um, for the lab on the lab website. It's under additional information. That should give you an idea of what to expect on the practical exam. Also, please bear in mind that the Virtual Edge makes a really helpful resource for this. If you've forgotten how to T-streak, go back and watch that because that will be one of the skills that you're tested on. You'll also be tested on aseptic pipetting. So that's another one. You can go back and watch that. You could also um, practice that if you would like. And I think some of you probably have already done that. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into what is probably one of the most exciting topics in all of microbiology. And I think by now you guys know how stoked I get about prokaryotes, but one of the reasons is because they are the only group of organisms that are capable of being chemolithoautotrophs. Now, that's the sexy term, right? We remember that that means that they are autotrophs, so they're self feeders. That means they can take carbon dioxide, inorganic carbon, and build it up to make their own organic carbon, cell feeders, autotrophs. But notice that they're chemo, so that means they're using chemicals, and if we're even more specific, chemolithoautotrophs. That literally means these particular bacteria and or archaea are eating rocks, lithotroph, rock eaters, inorganic compounds are serving as their breakfast. So I have a great picture and this was actually drawn um, a couple of years ago by one of my students named Cameron and I thought he did a fantastic job and maybe it'll bring uh, lithotrophs to life a little bit for you because these again are rock eaters. So if you think back and I hope most of you have seen The Never Ending Story or read The Never story. Remember the rock eater in that? Well, this is what lithotrophs do. They chow down on rocks for breakfast. So this is the picture that Cameron made, and I'll just hold that up. You can see there he's got written uh, chemolithotrophs rock. <laughs> they do. They rock. So let's talk a little bit about them. We remember that, um, so let's just write down prokaryotes are alone in their ability to use inorganic compounds as an energy source. And remember that they will probably live in very close, a sort of close love, love way with those organisms that are creating these inorganic compounds as a byproduct. So remember when we talked last time, we had talked about the idea of anaerobic respiration. And remember, with anaerobic respiration, something besides oxygen was the last member of that electron transport relay team. 
And one of the things that could be a terminal electron acceptor, we talked about um, when, when sulfate or sulfur could serve as a terminal electron acceptor, and it makes that really smelly hydrogen sulfide gas, right? Well, hydrogen sulfide gas, chemolithoautotrophs are like, yeah, breakfast, right? And they're going to chow down on that. So the byproducts of anaerobic respiration, such as hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide gas, such as nitrite, um, things like that are going to serve as the energy sources for these rock eaters. So you can see how they would like to live in an environment near these anaerobically respiring bacteria, even though chemolithoautotrophs themselves are generally aerobic bacteria. They're generally using oxygen as their terminal electron acceptor. So here you have our anaerobically respiring bacteria. They're generating something like H2S or something like nitrate and the chemolithoautotrophs are like woohoo I eat you for dinner and they'll take their byproducts hydrogen sulfide or nitrate or other ammonia or you know things like this that they're going to utilize as their energy source and they'll rip and strip high energy electrons off of them so they're not unlike us in that strategy ripping and stripping high energy electrons off of their energy source which instead of being donuts is raw Talks. So let's talk about the types of inorganic chemicals that can serve as energy sources for these bacteria. Some of them quite literally eat the very explosive hydrogen gas. These are hydrogen bacteria, so they'll rip and strip their electrons off of hydrogen gas. There are some that, as we mentioned, eat hydrogen sulfide gas. These are called sulfur bacteria. Um, and in fact, I'm going to talk in just a moment about one special sulfur bacterium called Thiobacillus uh, thiobacillus ferrooxidans and thiobacillus, right, thio, I know uh, Sakun right now is probably recognizing that term as meaning sulfur. So here is a sulfur eating bacillus and ferrooxidans, ferro iron, right, that's oxidizing iron. I bet Jesse is recognizing that, right, uh, the oxidation of iron. So Thiobacillus ferrooxidin is not only a sulfur bacterium, but it's also an iron bacterium. It eats reduced sulfur, it eats reduced iron. So the ferric form of iron is what it sees for dinner. We also have those bacteria that are called nitrifying bacteria. We can split them into two groups. The first type eats nitrite. Uh, oxidizing that form of nitrogen, but type 2 oxidizes ammonia. Imagine that. So in the soil, we can imagine these being very important in the nitrogen cycle, but if you think about something literally living off of a, your household ammonia cleaner, that's what type 2 nitrifying bacteria are capable of. And obviously they're going to come up again because yes, they do play a pivotal role in that uh, nitrogen cycle. So these chemolithoautotrophs rip and strip high-energy electrons off of these inorganic chemicals, and they transfer those high-energy electrons to an electron transport chain, where, again, those electrons are passed from one member to the next to the next, and protons are pumped, and guess what? Oxygen usually serves as their terminal electron acceptor. So even though they're eating rocks for dinner, they are aerobically respiring organisms. So they share that with us. They just don't share what they like to eat as their energy source with us. What we might guess now, and I was talking, I believe it was with John the other day, we were talking about chemolithoautotrophs and how um, they, although they can't generate as much energy from these these compounds, they don't generally have very much competition, right? There aren't that many forms of life out there, and certainly no eukaryotic forms of life, vying for hydrogen gas as the energy source. I mean, it's not exactly your most competitive world there. So although they can't generate as much energy per hydrogen gas molecule, they don't have a whole lot of competition. They thrive in extreme environments where reduced inorganic compounds are often found, and where they don't often have a whole lot of competition for those particular energy sources. So let me talk just a moment more about thiobacillus ferrooxidans, and I want to take you to my hometown of Leadville, where we've already visited once before. Remember in Lab 6, we isolated a, an acidophilic bacterium from the acid mine drainage from the... Um, 
the site in Leadville. And I'm going to show you a picture again of that site that I took this summer right along the bike path, which is... Um, it's a bike path that goes through all of the interesting mine regions around the town. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, you can see Mount Massive in the background here. You can see Mount Albert would be over to this side, the two tallest peaks in the lower 48. It's an absolutely beautiful place, but it had a huge amount of mining in the late 1800s, and acid mine drainage has been one of the big impacts of that. Thiobacillus ferrooxidans is a big contributor to this acid mine drainage, and you can see how the acidity of the water um, is allowing certain minerals to be solubilized and giving this very, very orangey, yellowy color to the mine drainage. Let me show you what thiobacillus does to contribute to this. It literally eat, eats rocks, and actually this is so close to home um, because when I was a little girl, we used to use as a doorstop a big piece of iron sulfide. So let me bring this reaction up that is catalyzed by thiobacillus ferrooxidans so that you guys can see that reaction. And hopefully some of you are recognizing this is iron sulfide here. So iron sulfide is oxidized. So notice that there is a ferric form of iron that can be eaten for dinner and a reduced form of sulfide that can be eaten as well to give an oxidized form of the iron. That So this becomes the ferric form. This is ferric oxide. And uh, sulfuric acid. Yeah, sulfuric acid, right? You guys are thinking, man, that is one wicked strong acid, and it is, and it leads to a lot of solubilization of other minerals in the water. So this is how thiobacillus is contributing to acid mine drainage. But maybe I'm hoping that some of you are recognizing this, and especially I think we talked a brief amount about it, um, and maybe you're recognizing this, uh, Dan, maybe I think you were the one that finally came up with this. This is fool's gold or iron pyrite. So we had a big piece of fool's gold that served as our doorstop when I was growing up in Leadville. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and move along. Um, it's hard to leave behind the rock eaters because they are really one of my favorites, but we really need to focus at this point on what is perhaps the most important group of bacteria. These are the photoautotrophs. So once again, autotrophs, meaning that they can use carbon dioxide to build organic carbon. They have that ability to be self-feeders. But recognizing that they're phototrophs, meaning that the energy source rather than inorganic chemicals is of course light. So we can see that light energy is the pivotal part of this and that light energy is harnessed to allow for the uh, generation of ATP and then that, that ATP and the reducing power formed in those light harnessing reactions are used to power the synthesis of organic carbon. So if we were to do, you know, if I gave you a pop quiz and I said, you know, hey everybody, just write down for me what you think photosynthesis is. I think most of you would say something like the, the harnessing of light energy to make chemical energy. And that would be a good definition. So the capture and conversion of light energy to chemical energy. Now, we've thought about this process in a rather... Mm, a rather limited way in the past because we've talked about only one kind of photosynthesis. That is, we've talked about the kind of photosynthesis in which we produce oxygen. That is, um, when water is the electron donor and electrons are stripped and ripped off of water, oxygen is produced. This is the kind of photosynthesis we think about, right? How many of you have said to your friends, you know, if only we could plant more trees because they do generate um, oxygen as a byproduct of their metabolism. Absolutely. But that's not the only kind of photosynthesis. So the net reaction that I'm going to put up here, or of course, bearing in mind the limitations of a net reaction, is going to show us a more broad view of photosynthesis. It's going to allow us to recognize that H2O, or water, is not the only thing that can be ripped and stripped of its electrons to provide those electrons for the reaction here. So recognize the carbon dioxide being incorporated to make organic carbon, so sugar, 
The electron donor can be water, H2O, but in some cases, in other types of photosynthesis, it might be hydrogen sulfide gas, the smelly stuff that serves as the electron donor. So to make this a broader statement, I'm calling this H2X as the electron donor, and then whatever is formed, we're gonna call X, although we know that in oxygenic photosynthesis, it is oxygen that is formed. So to finish out that reaction, we know that water is also a product of that. Um, so recognizing the fully and completely balanced reaction for photosynthesis and bearing in mind the diversity that we can see there because if water is the electron donor, then oxygen is the byproduct. And that is a type of photosynthesis called oxygenic photosynthesis. So I can't remember, but I think it was either Dan or John I was talking to the other day about their Winogradsky column, and we were starting to see the development of lines in that column. Soon, I hope even more lines will develop, and maybe you will get a column that looks something like this. So what we recognize in this column is that you've got deep down the um, production well, you've got anaerobic respiration, right? Anaerobic respiration is going down on down there. Fermentation is going on down there. The byproducts of anaerobic respiration, we know that one of those is hydrogen sulfide gas. That hydrogen sulfide gas is wafting up and serving as an electron donor for anoxygenic phototrophs. So in our column, these bands of very beautiful purple and green bacteria, hydrogen sulfide, um, oxidizing bacteria, they're anoxygenic phototrophs, meaning that they are using something besides water as their source of electrons. So anoxygenic phototrophs. Now up above where we start to get more oxygen present, well these are stripping and ripping their electrons off of water. So these are our oxygenic phototrophs up here. And Zach will be excited to know that those are the cyanobacteria that you did such a great job writing about on your mitochondria chloroplast question on the exam. Um, so these are going to be able to rip and strip their electrons off of water. And they're going to be the ones making oxygen. So now that we have this as background, let's look at the two um, the two ways in which we can split photosynthesis. That is to say, we can split it into two parts. There are the light-dependent reactions, and there are the dark reactions, or the light-independent reactions. Of course, the light-dependent reactions are those that are harnessing the energy of light to make ATP and to make reducing power. The dark reactions, or the light-independent reactions, these are the reactions that are proceeding with the products of the light reactions, but they themselves do not rely directly upon light. So the light-dependent reactions, they derive energy from sunlight. They harness it, they transfer it, they uh, allow it to excite electrons, and they allow it to be used to make ATP in an electron transport chain. So this is the harnessing of light energy to make chemical energy. Recognize that that chemical energy is then needed to power the dark reactions. We know that the synthesis, the biosynthesis, the anabolism, the making of a larger molecule in the form of organic carbon, that anabolic reaction requires ATP, right? It's endergonic, energy consuming. That was another question on the exam. You know, asking you to look at a pathway and say, hey, that's consuming ATP, that's endergonic, that is energy consuming, that's an anabolic pathway. So this ATP is used to build organic carbon from carbon dioxide, from inorganic carbon. A small molecule used to build a larger molecule. This is sometimes called carbon fixation, meaning that it is making the organic form of carbon, the type of carbon that is used by chemoheterotrophics, chemoheterotrophs for their metabolism. So we know, though, that this biosynthetic reaction is not only is it going to require energy, but it also is going to require reducing power. 
And we further know that that reducing power, and I think it was Nolan the other day who correctly answered this, NADPH is providing that reducing power. So where is that going to come from? Well, that's going to come from two different places, depending on whether we're looking at oxygenic photosynthesis. Then it's going to come from ripping the electrons off of water. So that water will be the source of NADPH. And you can even put that in parentheses if you guys would like to. The, the type of reducing power that we're talking about here is NADPH. Of course it is, because it's being used to power anabolism. So when water is ripped of its high energy, or excuse me, it isn't high energy at all, right? The light is what excites it to make it high energy. So when water is ripped of its low energy electrons, um, that is going to leave as a byproduct oxygen. And that's where we get the name oxygenic photosynthesis. It's because these organisms produce oxygen because they produce oxygen. Don't get hung up on that because sometimes people on their exam will tell me, oh, oxygenic phototrophs are called oxygenic because they require oxygen. And that's not why they're called that. They're called that because they produce oxygen. And again, our very favorites, the cyanobacteria, are a great example of this. So although plants and algae are also oxygenic phototrophs, Bear in mind that more than 50% of all photosynthesis is done by the bacterial world. So they're playing a huge role in this as well as plants and algae. Now, the other type of photosynthesis we know is anoxygenic, where they're using something else for their reducing power. In fact, something like hydrogen sulfide, ripping and stripping electrons off of that molecule. They do that because they simply don't have the oxidizing power to rip and strip the electrons off of water. So these anoxygenic phototrophs still can produce reducing power. This is things like our green and purple bacteria. So they provide reducing power as well. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why did Rachel not put these into the light dependent box? You know, over here we've got the, the yellow light dependent reactions. Why didn't she put the anoxygenic phototrophs into that light dependent reaction box? I didn't because they tend to absorb wavelengths of light that are closer to the IR. That is between around 800 and 1040. So they're not particularly visible to our eyes. And that's why I thought I would differentiate there so that you would recognize that the wavelengths of light that they're using are may not be visible to us. But in any case, this reducing power is required by the dark reactions, the light independent reactions. They consume reducing power, right? They're reductive. They consume ATP, right? They're endergonic. So we recognize those as needing the products from the light reactions. Marvelous. Now, the next picture is one of my favorites because it allows us to make a, a broad statement on one characteristic that, that characterizes all of our phototrophs, and that is makes them all beautiful. Because when they're l absorbing light, they have to be pigmented. So we have the beautiful cyanobacteria in the upper three quarters here, these um, upper two pictures. Uh, we have one of my favorites, no stock. Notice that no stock lives in communities. It lives in communities where they actually divide labor amongst the cells. This one you can see is specialized. It's specialized to fix nitrogen, and none of the others do that. So it fixes nitrogen for all the others, whereas all the others give it organic carbon. Oh my gosh, right? These live as a community. It's so cool. Um, and then we down here on the, on the lower right, we see the purple bacteria where they have their purple pigmentation. They're anoxygenic rather than oxygenic phototrophs. So let's talk about these pigments that typify our, our photosynthetic bacteria. So chlorophylls, carotenoids, and phycobilins, these are all colored pig pigments that are used to capture light energy. And depending upon the, the um, color of the pigment of light uh, of the pigment, it will affect the wavelength of light that they can absorb. So for example, chlorophyll A, it's a green colored pigment. Well, that means that it absorbs light at about 665 nanometers and about 430 nanometers. And those are um, in the blue, and, well, they're the red and the blue respectively, right? The red and the blue respectively. So that means that chlorophyll A transmits green. We see green because it's absorbing the red and the blue. Um, so chlorophyll A is not only phenomenal in, in its coloration, but 
Chlorophyll A is a wicked strong oxidizing agent. That is, it has an incredibly high desire for electrons. So it can rip electrons off of water. And that's where it differs from the pigment that you see, the primary pigment that you see in purple and green bacteria called bacteria chlorophyll. Again, it absorbs light at about 800 to 1040, meaning that it is not near as strong of an oxidizing agent as chlorophyll A, and it can't rip electrons off of water. Instead, it has to rip them off of something like hydrogen sulfide gas. So what we can say is that chlorophyll A and bacterial chlorophyll absorb different wavelengths of light, they do different things. And so it's a pretty sweet deal because it means that the cyanobacteria don't directly co um, compete with the purple and green bacteria for environmental niches. They have their own. They live in their own unique environments and they don't particularly compete with one another. And that's kind of a cool thing about them. Now, both of them have accessory pigments, carotenoids and phycobilins. Now, I have a feeling you've heard of the carotenoids, um, beta carotene, for example. They're orangey in color, sometimes yellowy, but sometimes even purple. And that's where the purple and green bacteria get their beautiful colorations is from their accessory pigments. Accessory pigments serve two roles. One, they enhance the ability to absorb different wavelengths of light. But also, two, they're protective. They're photoprotective. So they're absorbing wavelengths of light that might damage or hurt cells that are photosynthetic, that are always being exposed to sun by, by design, right? Now, you might think, well, these pigments, you know, do they just, like, run around in the cell just, like, naked, you know, kind of hanging out? Here's a pigment over here. Here's a pigment over there. No, they don't. They're actually um, organized, very nicely organized into complexes that are called photosystems. Now, these photosystems associate in some particular space in a cell. In green sulfur bacteria, they're actually found in what are called chlorosomes, which are regions associated with a membrane, but they're distinctive discrete structures. Um, in purple sulfur bacteria, they're found, uh, the photosystems are found associated with a cytoplasmic membrane. And, Carl, I think it was you who asked me the other day, in cyanobacteria, they're found in thylakoids. So yes, there are thylakoids in bacteria. So further credence to the endosymbiont theory, that could have been something that you listed uh, on the exam for that particular question. I think somebody kind of got to that, but not, not a lot of answers uh, in that respect. Let's now look at photosystems. This is a generic picture of a photosystem, and it is a cartoon. And I'm going to say that again. This is a cartoon. <laughs> this is showing us that a photosystem is kind of like a funnel. Um, it is lined with photosynthetic pigments so that as a funnel, it can grab as much light as possible. Think about it as being kind of like a solar panel, right? It's designed to gather as much light as possible. So the entire funnel or sink is lined with photosynthetic pigments. And those photosynthetic pigments grab onto uh, as much light energy as possible. And they all transfer that light energy down to the bottom of the sink. They funnel it down. So all of the light gathering pigments uh, are called the antenna complex. And down at the bottom is called the reaction center chlorophyll. So when light hits these antenna complex pigments, the energy is transferred down, like bing, 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 bing. And it's transferred in the form of something called excitons, which... Um, you may be, uh, Brianna, I know you study a lot of math and maybe some physics. You maybe recognize that these are electron hole pairs. But if you don't, just bear in mind that energy is transferred to the bottom of the funnel and to the reaction center chlorophyll where electrons are excited. That is, they're given a much more negative standard reduction potential so that they'll transfer their electrons to the top of an ET.